We on? Oh, there we go. So you dial that back, dial that back. All right, good morning, church. I'm Pastor Brent, and this was meant to be uh, a one single sermon. So I filled in for Pastor Bill last weekend as he was out of town, which has turned into a three-part series. So uh, go to the next slide, please. Come on. All right, so that's where we're at in, in this series. And I, I loved what Pastor Bill uh, said during announcements about um, we have our ladies out at the women's conference this weekend, at least uh, a good portion of them. And so we have the kids in service with us today. And so we'll try to keep this, um, keep them focused. But kids, Trey, Christopher, John Harvey, there's no age limit on the Holy Spirit. So these gifts of the Spirit that I'm talking to you all about are not just for the adults. These are for you, too. And, and you can receive the Holy Spirit. You can have a prayer language. You can operate in the gifts of the Spirit no matter what your age. It's not about your age, but it's about your desire. And you're asking God, because they are gifts. And as we know, gifts are not something that are taken. They are received. And God gives us to us liberally when we ask. So hopefully you guys will get something out of this, and you'll learn something that you didn't know. And I know for my son that oftentimes when he's off, like, doing something, he's actually paying attention, because uh, he would be that age and be drawing or whatever, and we think that he wasn't even listening, and then we get, you know, on the ride home, we start asking him questions, he was, like, totally tuned in. So that's okay. I don't take it as uh, you're ignoring me. Okay, so... Uh, those who uh, are listening online and missed last week, I encourage you to go back and, and listen because that's really foundational um, to what I'm preaching on today and next week. Um, and some of this may not make sense if you didn't hear the first part. So um, what we covered last week was the foundational truths, the foundational teachings uh, around this idea of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, these included a... Uh, discussion of the doctrine of cessation, uh, meaning that the, um, the gifts of the Spirit are no longer for today, that they ended with the uh, apostolic age, which was the time that the disciples uh, were alive and the church was uh, founded after Jesus' death and resurrection. And uh, several uh, denominations today uh, believe uh, in that. And so um, we throughout our years of attending church, have gone to Pentecostal and non-Pentecostal churches. But it's always important in those who believe in, the, in, in Pentecostal doctrine, uh, you don't always have to go to a Pentecostal church, but it's important for you to understand what the doctrine of the church that you're attending is. So I always encourage people to go online as you're searching for churches, because uh, you may not have a church in your area that is four square, um, and look at their doctrine and examine whether it aligns with what, what you believe. So, um, you know, what's important to me is not necessarily that um, the church embraces the, the doctrine of the gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit, but that it, it does not oppose it. And there are some churches that oppose that, that teaching, believes that the Logos Word of God in the form of the Bible is, is the only uh, way God speaks to us, and, and that the gifts are no longer for today, and that's just some, uh, an environment that I cannot operate in personally. And again, like, like Pastor Bill was saying, I, this is not to say that those people aren't saved, because it's simply believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that he's Lord that, that um, qualifies you as a Christian, and those people do have the Holy Spirit, uh, because uh, God's Spirit comes and inhabits our spirit when we're saved, and that's the, the next... Um, one of the doctrinal truths we talked about, the triune nature of man, that we're spirit, soul, and body, and the Holy Spirit inhabits our spirit when uh, we become saved, but our mind, will, and emotions, which make up our soul, are becoming more like him, becoming perfected uh, through the, uh, the act of sanctification as we become more like him as we live out this, this journey of being a Christian. So um, that's not to say that people that, that are not Pentecostal aren't saved, because they, they, they are. They have the Holy Spirit, and they can hear from God. 
It's just that what we're talking about is a fullness of, of the Holy Spirit uh, when we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit and being, being full of Him. And that, that is an additional step of, of inviting God to come in and fill us uh, beyond just an initial salvation experience. So another uh, doctrinal truth beyond the triune nature of man that we discussed with, is that God's Word does not change. It's, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That Jesus was from the beginning. He's going to be to the end. Uh, along with uh, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And uh, they do not change. What they say in the Bible does not change. There was not one set of rules for the Old Testament, which is different from the New Testament. That's one set of rules in the New Testament during the apostolic age that, that's not true for today. It, it continues on through eternity. And we finished up with a discussion of the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit and salvation and, and what are the differences uh, with uh, those two experiences. We looked at uh, Luke, uh, John, and Acts to kind of glean, okay, what are these experiences depicted in the Bible and how are they different? So again, if you did not catch that, I encourage you to go back and listen to that. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the outward manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, next uh, week, uh, keep go back to the slide. Uh, next week, we're going to get to the inward gifts. Um, so uh, today, we are going to be talking about the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we can go to the next slide. Come on. And so here's the list of topics for today, the purposes of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the types of, of spiritual gifts. There's nine of them. And then uh, if I got time, we'll take some questions uh, because some of this can get confusing, and there may be some stuff that you've experienced that was not clear to you. And hopefully we can uh, clear that up, any questions that you may have. And then, um, again, the, the following week on Palm Sunday, we're going to talk about the inward manifestation, uh, specifically the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the, uh, the receiving of a prayer language and talking about that in more detail. And then there's going to be a time for ministry, and I encourage the kids to come up as well when we have the altar call for us to lay hands on those who have not had the, this experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, those who have and just want an infilling, because this is not a one-time deal, and uh, those who, who have maybe been um, filled with the Spirit but have not had uh, received the, uh, the gift of tongues and a prayer language and, and want to experience that. We'll talk about some, some blockages and some reasons why uh, people may have a hard tr uh, time after, after getting prayed for to receive the Holy Spirit that they are unable to speak with tongues and kind of working through some of that. So our scripture references for today will be from the New American Standard Bible, unless I uh, tell you otherwise. And let's get into uh, the content. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So we're going to talk about the purposes of uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to, be before I get into that, talk a little bit about my journey. So last week I kind of shared that I grew up Presbyterian, and uh, Presbyterian Church is one of the... Um, churches that, that adhere to Reformed ideology or, or doctrine, and uh, they uh, would be considered cessationist in their views of, of the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, so I did not learn about the Holy Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit. The really, the, the focus was on God the Father, God the Son. Yes, there's an acknowledgement of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's a strong foundation laid in, in Scripture in learning the Word, of, uh, especially the Old Testament and and about that, but I never learned about the Holy Spirit, uh, really. That was really not discussed or taught on within the church. So I went off to college, and I got involved with a group uh, called Chi Alpha, which is the Assemblies of God Outreach. Assemblies of God is very similar in doctrine to the Foursquare Church. And that's where I got exposed to this concept of the Holy Spirit, that, that the Holy Spirit is not just uh, a, a third part uh, of the Trinity, but, but he's, he's an actual person, and, and he comes in and dwells in us, and, and there's actual gifts that are involved with his, his infilling of us that, that we as believers can have. And at, at first, it kind of freaked me out because I was not used to that type of worship and, and the energy and, and the speaking in tongues and the uh, people raising their hands during worship, and, and we're not singing hymns. We're singing, like, uh, worship songs. It was, it was quite different for me. But after a while, I, I learned that there's something missing in my life that I wanted more of. And so this, this began a journey of exploration and learning, and um, which got me to uh, October of 1987 when I went forward during an altar call with I had my hands laid on me, and uh, I received the Holy Spirit at that point. Um, after that, after I graduated uh, college, I went down to Pensacola to flight school with the Navy 
and was involved in a non-denominational Pentecostal church. So if, if you have not experienced Southern Pentecostalism, you simply have not experienced the full depth and breadth of the church because it, it can get wild sometimes, you know? It can get wild with people uh, up and dancing and raising flags and, and all this kind of stuff, and, and that's okay, you know? That's a diff just a different expression of, of people uh, praising God and worshiping. And then uh, after I finished flight school, I went up to Whidbey Island, Washington in the Northwest. I'd never been on the West Coast before. I grew up in Chicago. So that was a different experience to, for, for me, living uh, on the West Coast. And uh, looked in the phone book for Pentecostal churches. This is, this is a, a thing like this big. It's, it's yellow. And it had, a, a, you know, different businesses and stuff and churches listed in it. You know, now, now we have Google. So we go on a Google Maps, you do a word search, and everything pops up. Uh, before, you had to, like, thumb through this thing and, and looking for stuff. And so I came to the list of churches, and under Pentecostal churches, um, I found the Assemblies of God, of, of course, but then I also found this thing you know, called Foursquare. Never heard of Foursquare. So um, it was the first church I visited, Living Word Fellowship in Oak Harbor, Washington. Uh, pastor Dave Veach uh, was the senior pastor, and Dave ended up becoming the, uh, the supervisor for the Northwest for a, uh, almost a decade um, before he retired. Um, but uh, he, um, pretty laid back guy, and it was a very much more, I guess, subdued version of, of what I, I had in the Assemblies of God. Um, it was much more grace focused on the on the message. The the gifts were practiced. Um, there was prophecy that uh, was uh, given during service. There was speaking in tongues. There was the interpretation of tongues. So the gifts of the Spirit were all manifested and believed in, but but unlike uh, some of what I saw in Southern Pentecostalism, it was not the focus of the gathering was to experience the Holy Spirit moving and the gifts of the Spirit. It, it was an enabling force, as we say in the military, to allow us to minister and, and, and take the gospel and to build us up so that we are equipped to go out and do. So it's not about necessarily being, which I think that's, that's maybe where the Pente Pentecostalism kind of can get to the extremes of, of where um, I just even remember, like, we went to a, uh, a Foursquare pastors meeting last week, and then uh, one of the pastors I was talking to said, hey, I'm coming to a tent revival. They're doing these tent revivals, you know, in, in Jacksonville, and they're meeting every night, and the Holy Spirit's moving. It's, it's awesome. And, and, you know, there's a place for that, but, but the place is not to, to go every night to a tent revival so that I can get filled up and, and feel God's presence, the, the whole point of God giving us his spirit is to do something with it, not just to be, but to do. And, and I'm not, you know, hear me here. I'm not saying that that's bad for us to go and be filled. That's a wonderful thing, and it keeps us going in life, and, and we need those mountaintop moments to be encouraged, especially when it gets tough. But if that becomes the point and the focus of our Christian walk, then, we're, then we've got it wrong and we're off. And we need to, to, to realize what is the purpose of God giving us a spirit. So we get into the four square doctrine here. This is really right out of our doctrinal statement. Um, there's four purposes of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, number one is to empower the believer. Number two is to give inspired utterance. Number three is to foster a spirit of prayer, holiness, and sobriety. And number four is to equip the believer for ministry. So we can go on to the next slide, and we're going to get to each one of these. So empowering the believer, what does this mean? So two, two examples here out of Scripture, and there's many more uh, that I encourage you to look at, but I uh, chose two of them. One is out of Luke, um, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And for those who are uh, listening online, this is out of Luke 24, 49. The next uh, verse is out of Ephesians 3, 16, uh, in which Paul says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So when Jesus is using the term power to describe the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, he is, is saying that I'm sending 
the promise of the Holy Spirit to clothe you with power. So, and, and it says, from, it's from on high. It's not from you. It's from me, and I'm going to clothe you, shelter you, cover you with this power. And then uh, Paul talks about what is the purpose for that uh, is to strengthen you in your inner man. Okay, so Paul, Paul uses this phrase, inner man, to, to describe our spirit man within us. So when we talk about spirit, soul, and body, that's, that's our spirit, is our inner man. Uh, it's just a descriptor that he uses. So the whole purpose uh, in, in number one is to empower the believer. But again, there's a empower the believer to do what? So it, there's also an action statement there. Um, and in giving inspired utterance, we'll look at the next passage out of Acts 4, 8 through 12. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, now, this is, uh, let, me, let me kind of tee this up a little bit. So this is uh, Peter and John. This is right after Pentecost when they receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, they're, they're going out and preaching, and there's like thousands and thousands of people that are getting saved. So that really bothers the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling party of the Jews. These are the same people, the Sadducees and Pharisees, that, that had Jesus arrested and crucified. And so they're saying, oh, my gosh. You know, we, we thought we, we had squashed this whole thing when we killed the leader, but this thing is going like, like gangbusters now because even more people than, than when Jesus was preaching are getting saved now, and they're converting to the faith, and they're becoming part of the church. And so they arrest Peter and John, and then they, they haul them before the, the council, which is about 70 of the elders, um, and, and they say, okay, you know, speak for yourself. What's going on here? And so we got Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. He says to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, of whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. And who he's talking about is this, this lame beggar, that, that reached out to them as they're walking by for alms and said, silver and gold we do not have for you, but get up and walk. And they didn't even lay hands on them. They just told them, get up and walk. And Jesus said, greater things shall you do than I did when the Spirit comes upon you. So Jesus would normally touch everybody when he healed. They just spoke to this guy, and he got up. So let's go on to the next one. So talking about Jesus, he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Continue on. Okay, go back. I got ahead of myself. Okay, so remember who we're talking about here. This is the same Peter that denied Jesus three times. This is the same Peter that when Jesus was crucified and, and, and was arrested, or when, G when Jesus was arrested, he followed Jesus at a distance. And then a servant girl confronted him. He, he was even scared of this, this young servant girl and denied that he knew Jesus when, when she said, hey, you were with him. He said, no, I wasn't. So we, we all remember that and the shame that, that he went through and so this is the same guy that, that now is a different, empowered Peter and is not afraid to stand up to the same people that crucified his Lord and Savior. So something has changed. Something, a, a swish has flipped within Peter here after he received the Holy Spirit. And now, now he's walking out in boldness. This is a, a different person. This is not the same guy that we saw at the end of John. So the, we also believe... Um, as we look through the, uh, the list, uh, we talked about inspired utterance, empowering, but that, that the Holy Spirit fosters a spirit of prayer, holiness, and sobriety. We can go on to the next slide now. So for prayer, it's out of Ephesians 6.18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. Not sometimes, but all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and, per, per, and petition, for all the saints. So we're talking about there, there's a, a shift that occurs when we're filled with the Spirit that we have a desire to pray at all times. Let's go on to holiness. In Galatians 5, through 24 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. But now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. He goes through a list before this of all the things that are contrary to the spirit. That's our, our fleshly man. And when we belong to Christ Jesus, we have crucified that. And we put on the fruit of the spirit, all this, this love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I don't know about you, but those are areas that I'm continuing to work at. But and my, my, my human flesh is not bent towards doing those things. They want to serve myself, not, not other people. And all those descriptors are, are for service towards others, to, towards looking outwards. And so without the Holy Spirit overflowing in me, I could not do any of those things. So the Holy Spirit allows us to, to walk in holiness, which is simply to be set apart and to be, be countercultural, which all those, all those things are countercultural to what we see around us. And finally, with sobriety, Galatians 5.16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Likewise, Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So when we're filled with God's Spirit, there's an urgency to spend time with Him, to act differently, to live a sober life that honors Him. So the prayer, you know, spending, spending time with Him, that, that desire to, to pray and, and be connected comes with the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The desire to act differently than what I'm inclined to do comes with the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The desire to live a sober life that... that is, is focused on him and, and is not conforming to the world um, that comes with the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not to say that those people that aren't filled with the Spirit, that, that, you know, that are saved, aren't going to be inclined to do those things, but there's more of that when you're filled with the Spirit and you're allowing God's Spirit to overflow you, Okay. And the last point is that uh, we believe that the filling of the Holy Spirit equips the believer for ministry. And that comes from Acts 1.8. But you will receive power, this is Jesus speaking, uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. So notice that there's a connecting phrase here, and. They're connected. You will re receive power and you should be my witnesses. So that's the action portion of why God gives us the Holy Spirit is not, not just to, to live a life that is pleasing to him, but it's also for us to do something with that that we can be his witnesses throughout all the earth. There's some other things uh, beyond those four main purposes that we believe in Foursquare. One is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for today. Uh, again, this did not just end with, with what's the times of the Bible, but it is for uh, today in the present age. And it comes in the same manner as depicted in the Bible, with, with the laying hands on and the receiving after salvation. Uh, we believe that this is not a one-time event in the believer's life, but that we must continually experience the infilling as part of our spiritual life. Uh, as depicted in Ephesians 5, where Paul encourages believers to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And finally, we believe in the nine gifts of the Spirit that are described in 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to get into those. Uh, they're available to the believer today, and they're dispensed as the Spirit determines. So um, not everyone is going to practice all nine of those. They're, they're given uh, to uh, believers as the Holy Spirit sees fit. And we don't know, you know, necessarily which gifts that we're going to be given. Uh, we can operate in several gifts regularly uh, where, where uh, there, there's ones that are more predominant and, and continue to, to come up and be used. Uh, other times they're just present for a season, like maybe uh, someone who's going out on the mission field for a season of life uh, may be imbued uh, with um, some spiritual gifts just for that, that period, but then when they come back uh, stateside or to their homes, uh, those gifts will not be, be present because uh, they're just given for that, that moment to equip them uh, for that point of ministry. So, so it, it varies. Um, but Paul says that we should seek the higher gifts. The, the, and that seeking also means that we're asking because James says if we, we do not receive because we don't ask. 
So, so as I go through these, if there's certain gifts that, that, that really strike you as resonate in your heart, like, wow, I really like to do that, then ask God for that. Just pray. And, and you know, this is not like a one-time asking, but as, as we're to approach the Father, it's, it's we're to be persistent in our asking. So, God, I really want to prophesy. God, I really want to, to operate in the gifts of healing. Uh, help me in that. You know, give me that, that gift. Hon, can you bring my phone up? I'm trying to be good about leaving it, but there is a, a passage I did not have in my notes I wanted to, to share with you on that, that idea of the gifts. It's right out of uh, Romans 12, 4 through 8. I don't have a slide for this. It's so Romans 12, verses 4 through 8. And, and Paul's talking here about uh, how uh, we as the church come together and we're all gifted in different areas, and it kind of goes in line with this. He says, for just as we have many parts in one body, and all the body's parts do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually parts of one another. However, since we have the gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, and again, the, the Holy Spirit is who dispenses these gifts, each of us is to use them properly. So we have responsibility there to use them if they're given, not to keep them hidden. If prophecy in proportion to one's faith if service and act of serving, or the one who teaches in the act of teaching, or the one who exhorts the work of exhortation, or the one who gives with generosity, the one who is in leadership with diligence, and the one who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So, so these are motivational gifts of, of equipping uh, beyond the spiritual gifts, which I'm going to go through. He does mix some spiritual gifts like prophecy in there. But the point is, for any of our gifts, uh, whatever their type, uh, we have responsibility to use them once we recognize them. And uh, that not everyone's going to get the same gift because he doesn't want us to be superhuman and to be only dependent on ourselves, but to be, to be dependent on the body working together. So we're all coming together, and Christopher may have a, a gift that he uh, shares with the body, and Trey, another one, and John Harvey, another one, um, and Keyshawn, another one, and Kavan, another one, and Kavan is using his gift of, of technology to bless us today. And... By all of us working together, the body is equipped for what we need to do. We're sufficient. We have everything that we need for, for life and godliness uh, because everyone's using their gifts. If people are holding back their gifts, then we're gonna be, uh, there's going to be a deficit there. We're going to be deficient, and something's not going to get done. And that's how God's designed the church to operate, that we're all coming together and contributing. So let's get into uh, the nine gifts out of uh, 1 Corinthians 12. And we'll read that through that together. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Next slide. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. And to another, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. And to another, the effects of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the distinguishing of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Okay. So a couple things uh, there. Uh, there's a variety of gifts. They're not all the same but it's the same Spirit that grants all of those. Um, they, there's, uh, each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, so each one of us can have these, these gifts, so each one of us is given it, but not everyone is given the same gift, and he goes through for one is, for one is, for one is, which meaning that he, God distributes these gifts throughout the body. Okay, we're going to get into each one of these, and we'll start with the word of wisdom out of verse 8. I'm going to have uh, examples for each one. Now, mind you, uh, just as we kind of look for consistency, uh, we're, we're looking for consistency and application, not necessarily uh, that this is sequential uh, after the Pentecost of how they were represented in the New Testament. So I'm going to bring some examples out of the Old Testament. Um, so what we uh, discovered last week is in the Old Testament, God came upon, the Spirit came upon in the New Testament uh, after uh, salvation and the Pentecost, 
the Holy Spirit is within, okay? So there's a difference, but how the Spirit operates is the same, whether it w he was upon or within Old Testament, New Testament, that is consistent. So um, when I, I'm giving, like, examples here, it's, it's places I think are the most consistent in aligning with, with the gift of the Spirit. So don't get caught up on whether it was an Old Testament or New Testament example. So we'll start with the uh, Word of Wisdom out of Acts 16.9. And this is uh, Paul. Uh, he's on a second missionary journey. He's already gone through uh, what is a modern-day uh, Turkey. He, he decided he was going to go back a second time and visit all the churches. Um, so he brought Silas with them, and they get kind of stuck on the western side of Turkey. And he says elsewhere that they were afflicted. They, they thought that uh, their, their persecution, their suffering, uh, even unto death. So it was like uh, they, they at one point thought that they weren't going to survive this. And then all of a sudden, God gives him this vision. And he says, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So God basically redirected uh, Paul in this moment. <clears throat> so get, Paul had one plan for how he was going to do business. He was going to go visit all these churches that, that he had planted several years prior in Turkey. And uh, God had other plans for him. So, so basically, God allowed uh, them to get persecuted so that they would cry out to him, and then God gave an answer in the middle of the night of saying, I want you to go over here. So this, this is what, uh, so when they, he got this vision, uh, it was a call to action, and they boarded a ship in Troas and went over to Philippi, and they planted uh, basically the uh, church of Macedonia and then went down to Corinth and, and planned the church down in, in southern Greece there. And if, if these events hadn't happened, then Paul would have never done that. So, I, you know, God had a greater plan to take the gospel to all the earth. And he used a word of wisdom, of, of, uh, which is given to an individual. So I'm going to uh, distinguish between individual and corporate. So this is given to a, an individual. So it's, 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 uh, if, if you are operating this gift, it's for somebody else. In this case, uh, the Holy Spirit was downloading directly to Paul, and he is the recipient. It uh, involves supernatural guidance and is often future-oriented. So it's a, a word of wisdom of, of what's going on and, and God uh, essentially directing or redirecting us to, to do something. Okay, so this is different from prophecy, and this is, we use uh, this term, you know, kind of fluidly, prophetic words. Someone give me a prophetic word for somebody, and that, if, we, if we're literal to Scripture, there, there's differences between a word of prophecy, a word of wisdom, and a word of knowledge, which we're going to get to uh, next. So we kind of use that, that prophetic word, well, in reality, of, of how um, they're used within and applied in Scripture um, even though someone says, uh, you know, I have a prophetic word for you, I don't believe that's actually accurate uh, scripturally. It's usually a, a word of wisdom or, or word of knowledge because those are directed towards an individual. So um, a example out of my own life, uh, essentially uh, a lot of you guys know my, my journey and uh, my um, addiction to pornography in, in 2012 uh, came to a head and uh, finally decided I needed help outside myself to get over this thing. So I got involved with Pure Desire and um, I started a, a, a group in 2013, joined that group, and actually I was leading it because there's no other groups going on. So it's just a bunch of guys in church saying, hey, we all have issues here. Let's go through this together. And uh, towards the end of that, that journey, uh, of that year journey, the Holy Spirit uh, told me to go back and listen to these prophetic tapes that I had from my time in Pensacola at that church. It was a very uh, prophetically oriented chur uh, a church, so they had made tapes every time I went up to an altar call to receive a, a word of, uh, a prophetic word, um, then uh, they'd give me a tape. And so I, I went through those, I, I listened to them, and... There was one from uh, 1993 uh, that I'd gone back to visit the church and uh, was there that weekend and went to this, this service. And there's an evangelist there uh, from Spain. I don't even remember what he preached on, but I have the, the prophetic tape of when I went up to the altar call. He laid hands on me. He said, son, you have the mantle of an evangelist upon you. And, you know, back in 1993, there's no way I would be up here with a microphone in my hand preaching a sermon. 
you know, that was not me. And I'm saying, you, you got to be crazy because I'm not Billy Graham and I'm not an evangelist and you're absolutely wrong. He said, many pastors are going to get saved in your ministry. I'm like, pastors are getting saved? That's crazy. <laughs> this guy's completely off. I mean, what does that mean? Pastors are already saved. How could they get saved? Um, and he said, I'm going to invite my friend to uh, pray over you who came with me today. He's, he's finishing his career in the military after 20 years. You're just starting yours. And sometimes it takes 20 years for the word of the Lord to be fulfilled in your life. So in 1993, that made no sense to me. I filed away and forgot about it. In 2013, in September, the third week of September, to the day that this, you know, 20 years to the day that this word was, had been given to me, I'm listening to this again, and it's like, holy cow. He was exactly right. Because now I'm feeling a call on my life of, of leading men and specifically pastors you know, out of, out of the sexual bondage that I had found myself in. And so it all made sense. And it was like 20 years to the day. That was the confirmation of, of when that was spoken to me that was fulfilled in my life and the calling was fulfilled in my life. Well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to become a four-square pastor. So I put in my credentialing paperwork. And I'm going to lead pastors in this area of sexual purity. I'm going to get behind the microphone. I'm going to preach on this and, and talk to people about it. And, and so that was the trajectory because God knew 20 years in the past where he was leading me. And the, and the crazy thing was that I hadn't even started acting out at that point. That came like six months later on my deployment. So even before I made the, those decisions that I was going to act contrary to his word and, and do this, he already had a redemptive plan for my life. That was a word of wisdom that was spoken into me because this man had no idea what he was saying. I didn't have any idea what he was saying. But 20 years later, it made total sense to me. Okay, so let's get into the word of knowledge. This is another one for uh, the individual. The passage that I'm going to reference is out of John 4, 15 through uh, 19. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. Now, Jesus had gone out. This was actually his, his first convert. This is a Samaritan woman who was at the well, and he went out of his way to encounter this woman. Um, and she, the Samaritans, um, if you know uh, any of the background, uh, were the, the northern tribes of Israel that had uh, been taken over by the Syrians. And the Syrians went and, and basically put their people uh, to settle in those areas. There's a lot of intermarriage happening. And so when, when Judah take, was taken away to captivity several hundred years later in Babylon and then returned, they, they always saw these, these people as, as kind of being outcasts because they had intermarried, which was against the law, and so they were not real Jews. <clears throat> and, and so that was the feeling. Like, and, and she even asked him, why, why are you even talking to me, you being a Jew? And so he goes into this uh, back and forth with her. It's really fascinating. If you haven't read, I encourage you to do it. And he talks about this living water, and we sang about that this morning, the living water that, uh, that's represented the Holy Spirit that's going to overflow us. And, and he, he kind of like asks her for a drink, but then, then kind of uses that to redirect to this discussion on the Holy Spirit. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw on. And he said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one to whom you are now, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So she was kind of doubting him up to this point, and then he, in all clarity, he basically saw into her heart and spoke a truth that only she would know and the speaker would not naturally know. Now, this is Jesus. So Jesus, I think he, he, even though he came in the flesh, he has some additional omniscience <laughs> being, being part of the Trinity that we don't possess, you know, as, 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 us, um, as believers. But, but that being said, you know, when, when this gift is practiced, it's usually the, the, the bearer of the message does not really know or cannot confirm what is being spoken, but it resonates with the person who is receiving it. And that's exactly what happened with her. So 
this is also a uh, confirmation of God's care for us. So what it's saying is, I see you. I see you in your struggle. And off, often this is, is highlighting an area of struggle in a person's life or a per, point of pain or woundedness that only the person knows about and, and the speaker would not. So this gets a little freaky when you're, when you're giving words of knowledge. And I've had these before where I've done altar calls and prayed for people. And you, you kind of go out there on a limb and saying, I hope this is from you, Holy Spirit, because, you know, I don't know. And, and you know, that's, that's a good question to ask because that means you're being humble and, and you're not doing this out of your flesh. Uh, but, but a lot of times, probably nine, nine or eight times out of ten, is, yep, it's the Holy Spirit because it resonates with the person. And they'll, they'll, you can see that their, their expression will change or start tearing up or something. And, and you know you struck a chord there. And it's really to connect with them to say, God is saying, I love you and I see you. Okay, and I did have uh, experience with this up um, when I did an altar call up at Centerville Foursquare in Pennsylvania, and I was talking about, about uh, biblical sexuality and everything. I had an altar call, but everyone seemed to be coming out for healing. And, and towards the end, I had a, a word of knowledge that someone in the audience was, was wrestling with stomach pain. And sure enough, uh, a young uh, girl uh, raised her hand, and I went over and prayed for her. Um, uh, to be healed in, in that regard. But it was one of those things where she was not, for whatever reason, wanting to come forward, but God said, I want to touch you, so I'm going to call you out. And, and, and by identifying her, uh, we were able to minister to her. Okay, the next one is faith. This is found in Hebrews 11.1. 1. So again, this is, a, uh, this is given to the individual. So this is not something that uh, there's a speaker-receiver type of thing, but it, it's, it's given to, it's the Holy Spirit downloading to the individual, supernatural faith in a circumstance. Uh, usually this comes when, um, you, I don't know if you guys have had this moments, but I have no idea what to do here. I'm feeling so overwhelmed. God, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Lord, you know, I need you now. And, and if you've had those uh, get up off the floor moments, that's that's uh, an example of faith. Now, there, the one I'm going to um, kind of uh, use is is a um, the Old Testament example uh, of Abraham's life, which is like kind of to the next level. But uh, don't don't minimize this as as being only these you know supernatural huge events like, uh, God, give me strength to lift this car off of this woman type of thing. Uh, this can appear in small ways as well in your life. So out of Hebrews 11.1, uh, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So the, the King James Version says it's actually the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In verse 17, uh, he gives uh, several examples of, of our patriarchs of faith. And here's the one about Abraham in 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. Now, God had told Abraham that through Isaac um, that, that he was going to bless the world and there would be generations that follow. that will be so large that they will be as much as the, the stars in the heaven. So how in the world can this come to pass if he sacrifices his son? It was to he to whom it was said, and Isaac, your descendants shall be called. He considered, that's, that's Abraham, considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. So this is why it's so important to read our Bible cover to cover, right? Because just reading through the account in Genesis, you would never have gleaned why Abraham would have followed through and, and the question of, was he really intent on, you know, sacrificing Isaac? When he, when he lifted up the knife to, to slay him, was he really intent on doing that? And the answer is absolutely yes, because Hebrews uh, 19 confirms that. What, what Abraham considered in that moment is, I'm going to be fully obedient to God to go through with this, because I believe God is faithful and true. I believe that, that when he says my descendants shall be through my son Isaac, that he's not going to give me another son, it's through him. And if necessary, he will raise him from the dead to, to fulfill his promises. Okay, so that, that's supernatural faith right now, supernatural assurance in the truth against the circumstances. 
So, you know, from, from my own life, when, when we've gone through these, these uh, cancer diagnoses from my wife, Nicole, um, there was a tipping point there where when we get the diagnosis, feeling overwhelmed, but at some point, God gave us supernatural faith that he's got this, you know, which, which allows us to function, which allows us, like right now, me to be preaching before you even while she's going through treatment. Um, and... I can't do that out of my own strength. If I operate out of my own strength, I'd be like walking around in fear and, and hunkered down right now. But because I know God's got this, I, I'm able to walk in peace and joy and love and be able to continue to do what he's called me to do, even in the midst of a very trying circumstance in our life. So there, there's, there's, there's variances of this. Don't, don't minimize when, when God gives you faith beyond your circumstances, that that's not a spiritual gift that he's giving you through his Holy Spirit, okay? Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, let's look at healing. This is the fourth gift. This is out of Acts 3 through 1, uh, 1 through 10. Okay. Now, this, this is kind of the precursor of the passage I, I read to you before where they were hauled before the Sanhedrin to, to account for their actions. This is kind of what stirred up everything. And then after this event, the people marveled and a bunch of them were saved. So it caused a whole bunch of problems for the Pharisees and the rulers because uh, these, these supernatural gifts were being evidenced by the disciples. And they said, you know, we thought we had stopped this whole movement and now it's just going like gangbusters. It says, now Peter and John were going to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Okay, so this guy was basically lame from birth. Okay? This, this was not like he fell off a ladder later in life and became lame. This is like his entire life. And, he, and it says, you know, he's, he's about in his 30s, maybe 40s by the, this point. Uh, when he when he's uh, healed, so he's been suffering for decades, <clears throat> and he's uh, he's uh, setting down uh, at the ta- uh, gate, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go in the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, "Look at us." And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by his right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. (coughs) So this is a guy that, that... it was very noticeable that everyone going in the temple saw this guy day after day for decades uh, asking for alms and knew that he had been lame from birth, knew the whole story, and God chose to heal him to, to confirm his word, what is being spoken, that, that Jesus Christ is, you know, did die, he was resurrected, and now he is living within us and, and, and doing marvelous works through his Holy Spirit. This is another one that's given to the individual and supernatural healing performed by the Holy Spirit through man. So the, the recipient of that is whoever is getting prayed for, and the, uh, the bearer of that is whoever is doing the praying. Uh, again, at that Centerville Foursquare altar call. Um, so the backstory on this one, uh, when I was in college, been attending Chi Alpha, and, um, my mom, uh, as I mentioned last week, I believe, uh, she had been uh, filled with the Holy Spirit in 1972. Uh, so even though we were Presbyterians, she had gone to this Pentecostal Bible study, and this is all during the Jesus movement, and, and she got filled with the Spirit. So, so she, was, she was open to that. I think her prayers are what opened my heart to it. So then I go off to college. I get filled with the Spirit. This is probably my junior year. My sister, my younger sister, seven years younger, had been in a, a, a back brace. She has scoliosis of the spine, which is a curving of the spine. And my, my aunt, we were over there for Thanksgiving, and my aunt um, decided we're going to pray for her. So we went to the back room, my mom, my aunt, and I. 
to pray over her, and, and she had, had studied up on this, the scoliosis from a healing standpoint, and she said often uh, it's because the, the legs are mismatched. One leg is longer than, than the other, and even a, a slight mismatch on that, if you're off balance, can cause your spine to, to curve over a while. And so, I mean, my, my sister was looking at maybe being in a, a, a back brace for you know, the rest of her life, and so we prayed over her, and, and, and no kidding, we prayed for that other leg to grow, and, and it did. And she, I don't know how soon after that, was out of the back brace and doing fine. And eventually she became a missionary to Turkey, and now she's working with Samaritan's Purse. And she is, um, I think about, she's about head, ready to head to South America uh, for equipping and supporting our workers down there. And so she's, she needed to be healed to be able to do this. You know, for what God was calling her to do, she couldn't function uh, if she was still in a back brace. Fast forward now to a few years ago, and I'm doing this altar call that I told you about, and this lady came up, and she said, you know, I've, I've, I have pain in walking, my gait's all off. I said, well, walk for me. I, I, I watched her walk, and sure enough, you know, she was kind of like slouched over a little bit. I said, well, put your legs out for me. So I said, sit upright, sit down in these chairs, put your legs out, right? Sure enough, that her... Her ankles were not aligned. I said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to pray for this, this leg to grow because your problem is, is, is not your back, it's your leg. Okay, so that's maybe some supernatural uh, word of wisdom that was operating there. God, God told me to do that. Um, it wasn't an audible voice, go do this. It was like he, he guided me and, 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 and using the knowledge that I had to, to ask these questions and so the, the word of not, wisdom was that it's not your back, it's your leg. And we're going to pray for that. So I closed my eyes, and I laid hand, I went into her with oil. I laid hands on her leg. And someone else had, had hands on her and was watching. I wasn't watching. I just said, God, you know, I pray over this, this woman's leg, and I pray that you would grow it and extend it and allow her to walk upright and normally the way you created, blah, blah, blah. And sure enough, I looked at, up at the person. I said, did you see anything happen? I said, yeah, I saw the, her leg, like, literally growing. I said, cool. Get up and, and, and walk. And now she's, like, racing across the front of the, the, the stage there. It's like, woo, amen. You know, and that's just, just, you know, number one, being obedient. Number two, using, you know, all the, the equipping that God's given me over the years. So God, you know, not only wanted to bless my sister, uh, back in uh, 1988, but he knew that I'd have this encounter with this woman much later and, and want to bless her 30 years later and, um, and then, you know, being obedient to do it, right? Because it's not about, you know, feeling revved up or like, you know, woo, you know, that's, that's not how the spirit operates. You know, we, we see some depictions on TV or videos and everything, and, and you think that, oh, I got to be like, you know, at, at a high rate of speed and like totally jacked up on the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not. It's just really God is a God of order and a God of peace. And it was just me being obedient in that moment, say, let's do this. Okay? And it wasn't like a, a Benny Hinn moment where I'm like, woo, and, you know, people are falling on the ground and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, he, he's got a legitimate healing ministry, uh, but it doesn't have to be all about that. And I think in a lot of times when it gets all about that, it becomes more of a show and an exhibition than, than about God's miraculous healing power and his, his desire to bless somebody. Because I don't want it to be about me, okay? The, the, the eyes should not be on me. It should be on the person that's receiving, okay? And then as we're operating these gifts, if the eyes are on me, then we got to rethink about how we are applying the gifts and our motivation for using them, okay? Because they can be, be twisted and they can be used selfishly and not for the right reasons. Okay. Miracles. We're going to look at John 2, 1 through 10. This is, uh, you guys all know this one. This is about Jesus. This is his first miracle of turning the water into wine. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine rain, ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to him, so she didn't accept that. She said, no, you're going to do this. His mother said to her, the servants, whatever he says to do to you, do it. 
Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine and did not know where it came from, <coughs> but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, but when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is another where the individual is imbued with his power, the individual who is doing the miracle, in this case, Jesus. And I believe Jesus was imbued at all times. Um, I believe he, he did go to the Father in prayer and in solitude to, to, to be filled with his presence. But I, I think that his, his level of, of being filled with the Holy Spirit was, was like, you know, way up here type of thing. But that said, um, the, the way he applied the miracle is consistent with how, how miracles would be applied today. Um, it's a supernatural work performed by the Holy Spirit uh, through man. I don't have a good example of one that I've observed or that um, God's used me in in this, uh, this realm. Uh, usually it's not, uh, this is something like, um, a, like a manifestation exterior to humanity, like, like out, out here of, of doing something. So, for example, the water turning to wine. That would be uh, messing with the the uh, messing with nature, right? <laughs> Doing stuff that's just not natural. And that's just like holy cow, you know, the parting of the waters. You know, when when the Israelites pass through the Nile, uh, that that would be a miracle. You know, we saw. If you want to, more examples of that, just go to the Old Testament with Moses you know, striking the rock and water coming out. Those those were all miracles. So again, that was God coming upon in the moment. You know, and he said, even greater things you shall do. You know, um, example from Paul's life when he was on Malta and he was uh, looking for firewood and the snake bit him, which was a poisonous snake. And the people were waiting for him to, to swell up and die. And he just flung it off back in the fire. That was a miracle. You know, so, and, and Mark says, even serpents shall strike you or you shall drink poison and it shall not harm you. Those, those would be all considered miracles. And that's, that's this gift uh, here. All right, prophecy. So we're on 6. This is out of 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 4. He says, pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. So that's, that's his, his God's uh, admonition to us, that we should desire and earnestly seek these things out. But especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for the edification, exhortation, and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Okay, so this is a corporate. This is our first corporate uh, gift. So this is not meant for an individual, but the receiver is the corporate body. So this is to be done in a body. Um, and it's uh, a supernatural word used to edify the church. It's used for three things. He says right there in verse 3, edification, exhortation, and consolation. So this is when God speaks to us. Not, so a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, God speaks to me. This is God speaks to us. Okay, and I'm sure we can uh, have, uh, we've, uh, have examples of that uh, from our own body here when, when people have given a prophetic word. And, and when you walk away from that, uh, one indication that this was from God is you feel uplifted. You feel uplifted. Uh, now, he can also have a convicting message, too, of, hey, you guys need to get your act together, or, hey, something's wrong here that needs fixing. But, but typically, it's not just doom and gloom. It's, it's pointing out something, but then I'm here for you. I'm going to bring you through this. Um, I have a plan for you. Um, you don't have to stay there in that state. Okay, so there should also always be an uplifting component to this. Okay. Distinguishing of spirits in verse 10. This is out of Acts 16, 6, 16 through uh, 18. So this is Paul. He's uh, in uh, Philippi. 
It says, it happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her master's much profit by fortune-telling. Falling after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bondservants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned to her and said to, to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. So, first question to ask yourself when you're reading this, well, how do they know they, that she had a spirit of divination? Did she tell them? Did someone else tell them? I think more likely is that, that Paul knew in his spirit what, what was, was, uh, she was operating off of. So she was a fortune teller, but, you know, she's probably not going to make a bunch of money, you know, advertising herself, you know, as having, I got the spirit of divination here. Let me, you know, read your, your palms or whatever. <clears throat> Give me some money type of thing. So she's a fortune teller. and we, we can, you know, drive down many roads in Jacksonville and see, say, you know, signs for fortune telling every stuff. So these people, you know, these are all counterfeit gifts from the enemy that they're operating under, and these are spirits of divination. So do not go get your fortune told, okay? We can see this in the Old Testament with Saul in the book of Samuel of what happened when he did that, and it didn't turn out good for him. And so this is real stuff, and you just open doors in, in the spiritual realm uh, and allow stuff in that you should not be allowing in, in as those who are sealed by, by the Holy Spirit, okay? <clears throat> so don't do that. And then, you know, when you encounter people who um, are around this stuff, you know, that spirit of divination can be passed on to others. So you may be encountering someone or ministering to them or something and notice something that's off, and the Holy Spirit may give you a word that they got a spirit of divination. And you might ask them and say, hey, have you ever been to a fortune teller before? And, and that could open up a conversation to confirm, yes, I have. And then say, oh, okay, that's what I've seen. I understand now, okay? And then you can pray for them, uh, just like Paul did, and, and that, that it be removed. So this is a supernatural ability to distinguish uh, between different types of spirits. Okay. Now, these, um, that, that one is, is more to equip the believer in the moment. This is maybe probably not one that you're going to you know, practice on a regular basis. It's, it's going to be God is setting you up for an encounter where you have an encounter with someone, and there's always an action step when you're giving these things. So it's not just the fact that you're seeing this. God wants you to do something with it. That's why he revealed it to you. So in all likelihood, you're supposed to pray over that person that they get delivered. So it's not just giving you knowledge. It's, it's like, okay, and take the next step, pray for them, Okay. And if he's giving you this knowledge and you pray for them, you need to believe in faith that, you know, greater is he that is in me than he is in the world, and that thing's coming out. Because I got the power. Right? Amen? Okay, let's, let's wrap it up with various types of tongues and interpretations. Okay, these two are connected to each other. They're not done independently. Uh, if, if, it, there's an, if, in, if interpretation of tongues independently is prophecy... So it's not the same thing. One comes after the other. So various kinds of tongues in verse 10, 1 Corinthians 14, 5 through 6. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets, so that the church may, be, may receive edifying. But now, brethren, if, you come, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or prophecy or teaching? So what he's saying there, he goes into some, some stuff before that, is if, if everyone comes and just starts speaking in tongues in service, there's going to be chaos and confusion and everything, and no one's not, no, what, there's no purpose in that. No one's going to know what's going on. So everything should be done, order by, done in order. And if, if tongues are going to be used corporately, not, not just someone kind of praying to themselves in the corner, but like up here in front of the microphone, speaking in tongues type of thing, then there should be interpretation that follows that, okay? So this is another corporate gift. Um, it's distinct from the prayer language, which we'll talk about next week, but it's going to sound very familiar. So if I'm operating in this gift of tongues and interpretation, I, I get the portion. It's, it's usually not the same person. It's usually two different people, but it can be the same person. If I get uh, operating corporately in this gift, it's, it's going to sound the same as if you heard me praying in my spirit. 
Um, and, and to me, the, the, the deliverer of that is going to sound the same in my ear, but the message behind it is going to be different. It's going to be a corporate message for the body. It's used for the edification of ch the church, and it's used in conjunction with interpretation. Um, and so if it's going on to the next one here, uh, interpretation of tongues in verse 10, 1 Corinthians 14, 13. So jumping ahead in that passage. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. So it is possible that, that I give the tongues and I also interpret. Okay, I've, I've, I've heard that uh, manifested that way before, or given that way before. I've also seen where, where one person uh, speaks in tongues and a different person interprets, okay? And that's even more confirmation if, if that operates. And uh, this happened, my, uh, my previous church, uh, the pastor was preaching on these gifts. She said, okay, we're going to practice. When she got down to these, we're going to practice this. And so when she got to this, this moment of, okay, does anyone have a, a uh, word of tongues for the body? I felt like um, God was giving me something. I'd never practiced this gift before. So, so I, I went up front and took the microphone and just, you know, started going. And, again, it wasn't, it wasn't this thing where I felt overwhelmed or everything. Usually when, when I feel like God's operating uh, in one of these gifts for me, I test it. And how I test it, I'll stay silent for a minute. And I'll say, God, is this me or is this you? And I'll, I'll wait, and what, what happens when it's him is is my anxiety level will start kind of rationing up i can feel inside of me like i you know i can't i i need to, to act on this i can't just sit here and be silent type of thing and that that that's how he's he's uh, trained me to to know that's from him because i want to wait because there's 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 time i mean i don't have to just blurt something out there's time to distinguish whether this this is from him or from from my flesh or maybe, and, and it could be something for the, the corporate body. We'll, get, uh, we'll finish with a discussion on that. Or it be, could be something for me personally. So I want to distinguish, if it's something for me personally, I don't, it's not you know, right for me to share that corporately. That's just for, for something for me in the moment. But if it's for something for the body, then I need to, to uh, um, say something. And in, in this case, it wasn't like, you know, like a like tea kettle ready to explode. It's just like, yeah, I need to, to get up there and do that. So I just took the microphone, and I just was obedient. And typically for any of these things, God gives me just like the first little bit. It's just like the first phrase, the first word. He doesn't download to me the whole whatever he wants to say because then I'd be trusting my flesh and not him. And once you're obedient to step out and open your mouth, then he'll start start giving it to you in the moment. Okay, and... and um, Jesus even says that. Do not be, be worried about what you'll say when you're held before authorities because the Holy Spirit in the moment will give you what to say. And that's the same thing with these spiritual gifts. In the moment, he's going to equip you and give you what you need in that moment. And that's where the whole faith comes in. That is, hey, this is not me. This is God. Okay, God, if we're going to do this, <laughs> I need your Holy Spirit to speak through me. So, you know, otherwise it's going to be pretty embarrassing. <clears throat> um, but in this case, yeah, it was God, because I, I got up there and did it. And as soon as I started speaking in tongues, one of the, one of the ladies just, like, started weeping. So whatever I was saying was, like, resonating with her spirit, because she just started breaking down and crying and, you know, wailing in tears. And then there's this pregnant pause, and then I didn't have the interpretation. I didn't feel like I was supposed to say anything after that, so I just stayed silent. It's a pregnant pause, and then their 8-year-old son was back there writing, just like Christopher's writing right there. He was writing. He was in the back helping help with sound. He wrote it out. And then he took the paper and went up to his mom. I said, and um, it was such a, a representation of God can use anybody that he had the exact interpretation through this eight-year-old. And, you know, what, what a confirmation. It does not have to be the adults. It can be our children that minister to us. And it was as a word I don't remember at all. I wish, I think I saved it. Um, it's in my notes someplace. I made a photocopy of it because it's so beautiful. But it, it was just a, a word of adoration for him and an encouragement for the body that I am with you and I see you. And uh, it was just beautiful. So it causes me to just to choke up, just uh, 
to realize that, that, that God is not limited by our age. So when this, this gift is present, like prophecy, it's meant to build up or edify the body. Um, and it's very similar to prophecy. The interpretation is going to sound very much like a, a prophetic word. It's just it's an additional level of confirmation so that if, you know, whether you be a believer or a non-believer, you walk in and you experience this. It's like, holy cow, God is alive and he's here and I cannot dismiss what I just heard. You know, and, and you know, for, again, to, to see that played out with an eight-year-old providing an interpretation that, that's beyond his years uh, just shows you that God is, is much bigger. When the Holy Spirit operates in these gifts, it's not, he's not limited by our intellect. He's not limited by our age. He's not limited by our understanding because it's his wisdom that's flowing through us. We just allow it. We're just vessels, and we, and we just uh, need to allow him because he gives us free will to, to move through us. And we're going to get into how that occurs uh, next week. We're going to close with this. We're already at, at noon. Um, we're talking, going to be talking about being done in order in the body. So our final passage um, is out of 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 33. So what is the outcome, brethren, this, of all this stuff that I've been talking to you? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three, and in each in turn, and one must interpret. But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and uh, to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So Paul is giving specific guidance here on how the gifts of the spirits would be used in a corporate setting. So he lays it all out there. He says, okay, you come together, this is how it, it should be done. The first rule is that everything should be done for edification or building up of the body. If it's not for the edification or building up of the body, then it's not appropriate to share corporately. Okay, and again, there may be times where he just he's just doing something in you, and that's fine. You know, I, I, I Pastor Helen is back there, and she'll she'll start praying in, in tongues or singing in tongues. That's that's between her and God. That's something that's happening between them. It's not necessarily for for the corporate body. Okay, if God gives you a revelation about something pertaining to your life and will not benefit everyone else, then keep that to yourself. Okay, that's that's something for you personally. Um, if you're pray, praying on your prayer language and the focus is directed inward and not outward for the benefit of someone else, then you should pray quietly to yourself or sing quietly to yourself. That's okay to be done corporately, but, but if you start wailing at the top of your uh, lungs and that's not um, for the corporate body, then that's out of order. And that, that may be, you know, a situation where Pastor Bill or me or, you know, Pastor Helen may come up to someone and say, hey, you know, this, this is not, um, because God will give the leaders of the church, you know, um, discernment into that situation. You know, brother, sister, um, you, you need to, to say this quietly to yourself because this is not for the body. It's being disruptive. And there's times in Pentecostal churches where that's the case, where people just, you know, get so overwhelmed by uh, the spirit that they, they just, like, let loose. And again, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. The Spirit will never force you to, to do something contrary to himself. and will never force you to do something contrary to your will. Okay? And so there's times when, when uh, more immature believers start, um, you know, testing these things out, and it can be disruptive to the body, and that's when uh, a leader needs to step in and say, hey, um, either, either go outside or quiet down. You're being disruptive. And, and God is speaking to you personally. That's, that's awesome, but um, this is not for the, the corporate gathering. Uh, the second rule is that when giving prophecy or tongues with interpretation, there should be two or at most three occurrences. So he, he actually prescribes both for, for tongues and interpretation and for prophecy that no more than three. Okay? So why is that? Well, he's encouraging balance in our corporate gatherings. In, in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, I don't think I have the, the verse for that up, but it, he says, what is the outcome then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the mind also. So there, there's roles uh, within our corporate gatherings, both for the Spirit to move, 
but also for us to be worshiping with our minds, uh, for our sharing of scripture, for the corporate body, which is with our minds, uh, for delivering a sermon like I'm doing, which, which is, you know, influenced and guided by the Holy Spirit, but it's not my spirit man delivering this. It's, my, it's going through my mind. Um, so my mind is fruitful. And that's, you know, th there's balance. And when it's all done, uh, incorporated together, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful occurrence, but what he doesn't want is, is that the emphasis every time you gather is, is purely on the Holy Spirit because the Spirit has a role and it's to equip the believer, okay? It's not the only way that we equip the believer. We can equip the believer also through the preaching of the Word and the encouragement of one another uh, the, the, for praying for each other, you know, to have having altar calls or praying quietly at your tables for each other. Uh, and that, that's all used to encourage and equip the believer. Okay. And since we have control with that, comes the responsibility of exercising restraint. Okay. We, we have to know and be discerning and asking God, you know, is this for me or is this for the body? Do I keep this to myself or do I share this with others? And that, that's being a responsible, mature believer when we're doing that. Okay. Because God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace, and we are to have order in our gatherings. They're not supposed to be a chaos, and they're not supposed to be running wild uh, type of things. All right, does that make sense to you guys? Okay, I know that was a lot, um, and I know we're a little bit over our time, but is there any questions that you may have on what I talked about today? Okay. All right, so for next time, we're going to talk more about this indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking about our prayer language and, and how that is distinct from um, tongues and interpretation. How do we, we uh, receive that prayer language? You know, how do we practice that prayer language? How do we develop that prayer language? And next week is Palm Sunday, so we're going to tie all this back into the triumphal entry, and you're going to see that the, the Holy Spirit and the and, and Pentecost is, is connected to, to that triumphal entry that we celebrate on Palm Sunday as we go into Passion Week and, and we recognize and, and, and thank Jesus for coming in the flesh and, and the suffering that he went through uh, that, that Passion Week as he um, separated himself from his disciples and said his goodbyes uh, during the Passover, how he's arrested, how he's beaten, how he was shamed as he carried his cross, how he suffered on the cross and bore our sins. He died, he went to hell for three days, and then he was resurrected in, into his glorious new body and sits beside the Father to judge us all and to once again come to earth to redeem his church. Amen. And these, these next two weeks are going to be pretty pretty good. We have some great stuff planned for you on Easter, so I hope you all can be here. Uh, Pastor Bill will be sharing more about uh, those plans next week, but um, it's going to be a wonderful time of celebrate, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Let's close in prayer. God, thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. I thank you for the, the, just the wisdom uh, that you give us uh, in these passages of Scripture, Lord God, that, that you have not left us... Uh, faltering without a guide, but, but your word, Lord, instructs, instructs us in all things. And by, by pulling back your word and, and going into its deep truths, we can, can discover, Lord, uh, the meaning of all this and, and how, uh, Lord, we can receive your Holy Spirit and use those gifts that you give us to equip the church and equip us for ministry of what you called us to. Lord, I just pray for that you would just protect and guard this word that has been, been planted in our hearts, Lord. The enemy would not be allowed to rob us of it, Father, but Lord, that you would just foster a spirit of uh, just inquisitiveness, Lord, and, and wanting to know more about your Holy Spirit, Lord. And, and for next week, Lord, in advance, I just pray for the just an amazing outpouring of your spirit upon our gathering, Lord God, and Lord, that we would just be filled with your presence, Jesus, and Lord, that the that, that time at the altar would just be uh, a time of renewal and a time of receiving from you, Jesus. And Father, any barriers that, that need to be removed, I pray that you would remove them in this next week. In Jesus' name, amen.
Okay. So Pastor Bill is giving me permission to share about uh, Steve Fagan, who uh, led worship for us um, down in uh, our, our pastors, four square pastors gathering in Orlando last weekend. Um, just amazing time of just worship. And um, Steve's got a background as a Nashville recording artist. He planted a church in Nashville and was senior pastor there for 20 years. And uh, his heart uh, in this next season of his life, um, as he's transitioned and moved down to Gainesville with his, his wife, uh, is uh, to just bless churches. And so Pastor Bill took him up on his offer and, uh, and threw an invitation out there at short notice to see if he was available on Easter Sunday. And we're delighted to say that he uh, has agreed to come and, and minister to us uh, in two weeks. So it's... it's uh, as someone who, who is a worshiper and has been a worship leader in the past, uh, I miss the, the live worship. Uh, you know, I, I, think, I think the YouTube stuff is, is good, and, and I think it's the, the best that we got going now for where we're at as a body, but uh, I look forward to having live worship again uh, here on the stage and uh, look forward to his ministry uh, to us. So it should be a great time uh, of, of uh, just connecting. I think coming after our, our time next week of, of receiving the Holy Spirit, I expect that uh, some, some amazing stuff's going to happen on Easter Sunday for us all. So I encourage you all to be here and, and, and get people who are maybe uh, stuck at home on Zoom watching our services who haven't been here in a while. I encourage them to come. 